I would like to call your attention this morning to two portions of Scripture. The first is in the Gospel according to St. John in the first chapter, in the 16th verse, and then verses 11, 12, and 13 in the fourth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. And then in Philippians 4, 11, 12, and 13, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I take these two uh, statements together for a reason which will be obvious to those who worship here regularly. We've been considering that great statement in John 1, 16 for many months and have worked it out as uh, it is expanded for us in the scriptures themselves. This tremendous summary of what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is a man who has received something of the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must accept no definition of Christianity which comes in any sense short of that. Belief is essential. Knowledge of what we believe is essential. But even that isn't enough. The devils believe and tremble. What makes us Christian is that we have received of his fullness. As John has already put it, In verses 12 and 13, as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. We are partakers of the divine nature. We are born again. We have received of his fullness and grace upon grace. Now that being the basic definition of a Christian, and having looked at it, uh, if you like, doctrinally or theologically, it is absolutely vital that we should test and examine ourselves to see whether this is true of us. There is nothing more tragic, according to the scriptures themselves, as that men and women uh, should imagine that they're Christian and assume it, and then find at the end that they're not. Our Lord himself has given us a very solemn warning with respect to that. People who shall come and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and that in thy name? But I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So it is essential, I say, and vital that we should prove ourselves and examine our own selves, whether we be in the faith or not. The New Testament is full of such exhortations. And that is what we are trying to do. And uh, the way we have adopted is this. There are many ways in which it can be done. We test ourselves by the explicit teaching of the New Testament. Uh, We also test ourselves by uh, individuals, persons, examples, which we see in the New Testament of men and women who had received this fullness and who manifested it in their lives and experiences. And we can supplement that by reading the long history of the church and especially the biographies of the saints of God throughout the ages. Well, now, what we are doing actually is to look at these glimpses that the great apostle Paul gives us of himself in this epistle to the Philippians. Here, for various reasons, he felt it incumbent upon him to give us these little insights into himself and his great life and uh, what it was in his case to have received of the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've considered several of these pictures and come this morning uh, to the last of the pictures, which is to be found in these verses 11, 12, and 13. Now, this one follows, of course, very directly uh, from the one that we were considering last Sunday morning, uh, where we found the apostle saying, be careful for nothing, But in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds 
through Christ Jesus. The man who has received of his fullness has peace, the peace of God which passeth all understanding. But it isn't only that. There is something even beyond that. And what is that? Well, that is contentment. It is one thing to be in a state of perfect peace in spite of your circumstances and surroundings, but that doesn't mean that of necessity you are enjoying contentment. But the apostle here goes on to tell us that in addition to the peace, he has a profound sense of contentment. Now, the apostle valued this very highly. You remember that in writing to Timothy, he tells him that there were certain people who misunderstood these things and supposed that godliness is gain. From such, he says, withdraw thyself. And then he adds, But godliness with contentment is great gain. You can be godly and you can have godliness uh, without contentment. But he, what the apostle says is this. He says, you know, uh, the supreme thing is to have godliness with contentment. That, truly, he says, is not only great gain, that's everything. The man who has that really is enjoying of his fullness and has clearly received grace upon grace. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, we'll all agree, I'm sure, that there is nothing that mankind is seeking for more assiduously this morning than just this very thing we are considering together. Contentment. How difficult it is to arrive at a state of contentment. The world, I say, is looking for this, and is looking for it in many, many ways. You see, wealth alone doesn't give you contentment. There are people who are very wealthy but are very disturbed, ill at ease, restless. And in order to try to find contentment, they use their money and travel around the world. What they're looking for is contentment, but they can't find it. There are others uh, who look for it by plunging into pleasure, well, I needn't weary. We all know what this means. We've all been involved in this great search for contentment. And yet how elusive it is. As I say, it cannot be bought, it cannot be commended. You may have uh, almost everything that wealth and money can commend, but it doesn't uh, give you an assurance of contentment. Indeed, some of these men uh, admit this in their autobiographies, I believe the wealthiest man in the world confesses that he hasn't found contentment. He hasn't found the contentment of a happy married life. And thus, you see, it comes to pass that of all these uh, desirable states, there is none that is more elusive than this particular one of contentment. But here the apostle tells us that he had found it. And he tells us that in many places, and we have accounts of him in many situations that assure us of this. Think of that lyrical example of it in the 16th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, where Paul and Silas were very wrongly arrested, strangely enough, in Philippi, and uh, were uh, not only put in prison, but they were put into the innermost prison, and their feet were made fast in the stocks. And yet what we read is this at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. That's contentment. That in the prison, at midnight with your feet fast in the stocks, having already been scourged, and all of it utterly unrighteously, they were enjoying this perfect and complete contentment. Well, the apostle, as I say, is never tired of adverting to this. Take, for instance, that other great statement of it in 2 Corinthians 12. He says, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that, he, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And at the very end of his life, we find him again writing from prison. He's facing death. Probably the last epistle that he ever wrote, the second epistle uh, to Timothy. Here he is. I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but uh, unto all them that love is appearing. Now that's contentment. And the apostle tells us here that it should be the lot of all who are truly in Christ Jesus. Again, I put it to you like this, that this needs no demonstration. What we are actually claiming is that we have received of his fullness and grace upon grace. I say it is impossible that we should have received of that in any measure without knowing something about this state of contentment to which the apostle calls our attention. It is possible to all, it is the business of all Christians to enjoy it. Now, why is this possible to all? Well, you see, for the reason that I'm giving. It isn't inequality in us. It isn't a matter of temperament. We know all about the differences in men and women in the matter of temperament, how some are more nervous and apprehensive and of the so-called worrying, apprehensive type. It's got nothing to do with it when you come to this realm. What gives contentment is his fullness and receiving of his fullness and grace upon grace. Well, now, very fortunately for us, the great apostle not only uh, tells us that he enjoyed this contentment, but he also helps us to see how we can become possessors of it. Let's consider his teaching. And as we do so, let me exhort you again to examine yourselves. These are the things that matter today. The world doesn't pay much attention to what we say. They say, well, talk is cheap. It's all very well. We can all be theoretical and we can tell people how to live and so on. But but the world ultimately tests the, the Christian faith and the Christian message by what it sees in us. It's no use saying, I rejoice in Christ Jesus. If you're miserable and unhappy when things go against you, if you're a warrior, or if you're always filled with anxiety, or if you're never content with your lot, it's no good. The world is entitled to judge the faith by what it sees in us. Therefore, I say there is nothing, as I can see it, if you are concerned about the state of the church, and if you long for revival and reawakening, there is nothing more urgently important than that we should start with ourselves, examine ourselves, and make certain that we are experiencing something of this divine contentment and that this is obvious in our lives to those who look at us. Now then, the Apostle I say helps us to come into this wonderful experience. The teaching is quite simple. Let me put it to you in the form of a number of propositions. Here's the first. It is a contentment which persists in all circumstances and conditions whatsoever. Now, this is again a vital point. You remember we were emphasizing last week that the apostle said in that matter of nervous care and anxiety, be careful for nothing but in all things. It was all inclusive. There are no exceptions. It's exactly the same here. And the apostle is at great pains to emphasize that. And of course, this is very vital. If you are only enjoying contentment when the sun is shining and when you're on holiday, well, of course, you know nothing at all about contentment. The test of contentment is whether you've always, whether you're always enjoying it, whether you are perpetually in this state of contentment. So the apostle goes out of his way, I say, by repetition to emphasize this point. Listen to the way in which he does it. Not that I speak in respect of want, For I have learned in whatsoever state, there it is, whatsoever state, 
it's all inclusive. I am uh, in uh, to be content. But then, you see, he knows us so well. And he knows as a wise teacher that it's not enough to make a general statement. You've got to test people. A man can say, oh, yes, I, I, I always enjoy this. Wait a minute, says the, uh, says the apostle. I know both how to be abased. There's a particular one. You say you're always happy. Are you when you're abased? I know both how to be abased. Not only that, but I know also how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Now, you can't add to that, can you? There is no conceivable circumstance, there is no possible eventuality, there is no imaginable contingency in which, says the apostle, I do not and I shall not enjoy this glorious contentment. My dear friends, these are the things that matter. Review your life. Can you say this? Can you use these all-inclusive terms? Can you say always and in all things, I am content. Have you received of his fullness and grace upon grace? Look at him as he lived in this world. And this is what you see. This contentment, this peace, this calm, this quiet. Ever in the hands of his father. And on the cross saying, into thy hands I commit and commend my spirit. It's universal. There is no exception to it. This is the glory of it. This is the uniqueness of the Christian faith, that it can defy every circumstance and chance and still promise to give us and to keep us in this perfect state of contentment. And secondly, of course, it did, and it follows from that, that what this contentment does is to render us independent of our circumstances. Now, it's important for us to say that and to look at that for this reason, that the trouble with most of us in life is that we are controlled almost entirely by our circumstances, and we are dependent upon them. Isn't that the cause of the lack of contentment, the dis-ease? It's because, I say, we are so dependent upon, well, dependent upon people. Happy with some people, made immediately unhappy by others concerned about what people think of us and what they say about us. And what else? Well, you see, a man may be successful, he may be wealthy, as I say, he may, as it were, have the world at his feet, and yet he isn't content. Why? Oh, there are still other possibilities, still other heights to reach, which he hasn't reached. There is nothing that is so productive with dis of discontent as ambition. And the world is full of ambition. Men anxious to get on anxious to succeed, every realm and department of life, in the professions, in social life, in wealth, in everything, always something further, fresh worlds to conquer. And an ambitious man never knows contentment. A man may have succeeded, I say, in a most admirable and unusual manner, but as the adage reminds us, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown, he sees others coming up, is he going to maintain his position? What's going to happen? Now these are the prolific causes of discontent, a lack of this great profound sense of peace and contentment in which the apostle rejoiced. And when you bring in lusts and desires, which have nothing but forms of ambition in the last analysis, you see how these things mar and spoil the lives of men and women. And thus it comes to pass that uh, people whom you would have imagined to be uh, in a state of complete contentment are often the most discontented. You don't need to know any psychology in any strictly scientific sense to understand this matter. Biographies are full of it, the novels are full of it. This is life, and we all know it in individual and personal 
experience. Now, what the apostle is saying is this, you see, that he's been delivered from all that. He's set free. He's emancipated. He is no longer dependent upon his circumstances. It doesn't matter what they are. It doesn't matter what they may ever be. It doesn't make any difference at all. This man has a position which is independent of what is happening round and about him. He's at a point and a place of calm at the center of the hurricane. And it can't touch him and it can't affect him. You see, he no longer relies upon circumstances and surroundings and people for his happiness and for his contentment. He's not governed by them. Well, we mustn't stay with this because I want to go on to other aspects of this truth. But don't you see immediately what a wonderful thing this is? How utterly dependent we all tend to be upon these various factors. Isn't it tragic to think that our whole day, as it were, can be upset by some triviality that may happen in the morning, an accidental meeting of a person or seeing a person? It spoils your spirit, it puts you wrong, and you become like a restless sea, as the prophet Isaiah puts it, which never finds rest. But that is the story of mankind. What a terrible thing sin is, what havoc it has wrought in human nature. That we should be so sensitive to these things and so dependent upon them. Now, this deep contentment that is offered us in Christ and results from receiving of his fullness is something that emancipates us from, it sets us free, puts us into a position in which we are entirely independent of them. But let us go on. Thirdly, the apostle tells us that this is something that one has to learn. I have learned, says the apostle. And then he says, I am instructed. Now this is, again, the most important point. I, I emphasize it for this reason. He makes it quite clear that this contentment is not something that happens automatically to the Christian. Now, oftentimes, in evangelism, that impression is given. Come to Christ, take him into your heart. Never, you'll never know discontentment again. You walk down the road of life, full of happiness and of joy, never any trouble. As if it happens automatically the moment you believe. But it doesn't. I have learned. You have to learn the lesson. There's an element of discipline involved here. Now, this has been, of course, a great trap to God's people throughout the centuries. They've discovered that though they are Christians, they're not contented. They haven't arrived at this position. And they have resorted to many means and methods in an attempt to overcome this. The whole of monasticism, in a sense, is based on a fallacy with regard to this very matter. The idea is that if you want to enjoy this contentment, you've got to go out to the world. It's people who upset you, you see. And it's transacting business and being in the midst of affairs. That's the thing that causes the restlessness. What do you do? Well, if only I could get out of the world. If only I could leave people and and leave these ordinary avocations and not be dependent upon them, then I should be perfectly content and happy. So you get your monks and hermits and anchorites and these various other people. They're all attempts to try and find this contentment. But of course they have all failed. Because the whole endeavor is based upon a fallacy. They fail to realize that contentment is the result of receiving of his fullness. And that he can give you that wherever you are. You needn't go out of the world. You can get it in the midst of the world. Even as he lived in the world enjoying it, you and I can do the same. And there have been many others. I've often felt that perhaps one of the most... uh, Remarkable examples of the wrong way of seeking contentment was the way that was adopted by a man who's been revered as a very great man and a very great thinker. There was a famous man who wrote a famous book, but he wasn't contented, he wasn't happy. And the method that he adopted was this, he changed his name, he became Air Craftsman Shaw. I'm referring, of course, to Lawrence of Arabia. You see, though he'd become famous and great and had written his great book, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, he couldn't find this contentment and he felt it was all because he'd become famous. Now, how can he get rid of this? He says, I'll never know contentment until I've got rid of Lawrence of Arabia. So he calls himself, goes into the Air Force and becomes Air Craftsman Shaw. 
how pathetic it is. That's the world trying to find contentment. And as I say, the history of the centuries uh, has abundant evidence of the ways in which uh, men and women have tried to do this. It isn't something that happens automatically. Neither do you get it in these uh, various ways. Well, how? The apostle tells us here, and he tells us this in a most interesting manner. Having said that in the 11th verse, I have learned, and there he means, of course, uh, experience, you come into the Christian life, you're born again, but you're only a babe, you're only an infant, and you've got a lot to learn, and you will learn. Life with its trials will cause you to learn, if you know how to face them in the light of the teaching of the Scripture. And that is what the Apostle had been doing. You think you don't merely react and grumble and complain, or you don't run away and become a monk. You, you, you stop and you think and you work these things out. And as you do that, you begin to learn. Now that is what the Apostle tells us. But over and above that, he tells us this interesting thing in verse 12. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, says this authorized translation, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Now the Learned authorities are all agreed here that the word which is translated here as instructed, a word incidentally which is only found in this one place in the whole of the New Testament, that it should be translated like this. I know both how to be abased and I know how to, be abound, how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am initiated into the secret. Both how to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. I have been initiated into the secret. Now, these learned commentators are concerned there. Some say, has Paul been borrowing from the mystery religions and so on? I don't believe it for a moment. There was no need for him to do so. But he probably did use a term which he knew was quite familiar. And so he puts this in this particular way. He says, I've been let into the secret. And it is one of the most wonderful secrets one can ever be let into. What he means is this, that the Holy Spirit has led him and has guided him and has shown him the way to this blessed contentment. And my dear friends, however much you and I may learn, and it is our business to be diligent and to learn and to work these things out for ourselves in the light of the Scripture, all this is wonderful, but over and above it we need to be let into the secret. And as you read the biographies of the saints, you will find that they come to this kind of point. There are many experiences in the Christian life. You don't stop with your first experience of conversion, regeneration. Oh, there are other blessed experiences. There are other turning points. There are other moments of illumination, which oftentimes to the Christian seem even greater than his First entry into the Christian life, and this is one of them. When a man suddenly is given to see by the illumination of the Spirit that there is that place of rest and of contentment, he's shown the way into it, and once he gets there, he's able to stay there. Because he now knows the method. He now can see how this is produced. And therefore, Whatever his circumstances and conditions may be, he always knows the way to get there. What is it? Well, it's all here. The apostle, you see, uh, puts it perfectly in the 13th verse. He's leading up to a climax. He's put it in detail. I do this, I do that. In everywhere, every position, every circumstance. And then he says, well, if you want to know the secret, here it is. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now then, here is the secret of it all. Now, again, you will be told, and rightly, that the best manuscripts don't have the name Christ, and that we should read it like this, I can do all things through the one, the one, which strengtheneth me. And you know, I almost have a feeling that that's better. 
We tend to use the word Christ, the name, the designation so glibly, so easily, so freely. It's good at times we should be pulled up, as it were, and read it like this. I can do all things through the one, him, that strengtheneth me. Who is he? Well, there's only one. There's no need to discuss this. There is only one who can do it, and he is the one, and the old authorized translators, their instinct as usual was quite right when they put in Christ. Lest anybody might have any doubt, nobody should have, but in order to strengthen us and help us through Christ, through him, the one, the only one that can possibly strengthen me. Well now then, how does he do it? What is, if I may use such a term, this mystic secret? How can we know this blessed divine contentment? Well, it seems to me that it works in some such ways as these. The moment you receive of the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ, your desire for these other things decreases. Now, that is automatic. They decrease of necessity. And isn't this something that we've all known in experience? I can't imagine a man who's a Christian who doesn't know something about this. The natural man, of course, he lives on these other things. He's bound to. Everybody's got to live on something. And he lives on people and excitements and interests and all the organization of modern life, the thing that is described so often in the Bible, the thing we see in the newspapers. And of course you can't go on without these things. Have I reminded you before of that extraordinary thing which happened in this country in the first week of the last war? I'll never forget it. War was declared, you remember, on that terrible Sunday, the 3rd of September, 1939. And then the government sent out an order that all cinemas and theatres and places of amusement should be shut because of the blackout and so on. And do you remember what happened? There was a protest. People wrote to the newspapers. They bombarded the local authorities. They said, these things must be open. We can't live without them. They said, we're going mad. You're going to lower the morale of the whole country. Why? Well, you see, they couldn't live without these things. And can you imagine this morning what would happen to millions of people if you suddenly put a stop to every television set working and every radio and every other means and form of entertainment? The world would go mad. The only justification for allowing many of these things is that it keeps people from something worse. But the moment a man becomes a Christian, the moment a man begins to receive of his fullness, his taste for these other things decreases automatically. I'm not saying it all goes. It doesn't. There is the fight, the struggle, the working out. But I say something happens at once. There is a loss of interest. There is a lack of taste any longer in some of these things. It delivers us from that entire dependence upon them, from that outer thraldom too. It's very wonderful, this. The great Dr. Thomas Chalmers, I think, put that in, this, in that memorable phrase of his. He talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. To use the illustration, it is when the new buds begin to appear on the trees in the spring that the old dead leaves are pushed off. You don't have to pluck them off. The new life pushes them off. The expulsive power of a new affection. And it works like that. And the moment we receive something of his fullness, our very desire for these other things is decreased and our dependence upon them is correspondingly decreased. But that's the negative. Come, hurry to the positive. The knowledge of him and his fullness gives us complete satisfaction. This is the mystic secret. To know him and to possess him and to have fellowship and communion with him gives such complete satisfaction that one doesn't need anything else. Listen to the psalmist saying, he says to God, thy loving kindness is better than life. 
God's loving kindness. If you've got that, well, it doesn't matter very much what else is happening to you or what may not be happening to you. Thy loving kindness is better than life itself. A man who has a knowledge of God's loving kindness, he doesn't want anything else. And uh, so, you see, we get these great statements. The apostle writing to the Colossians says that Christ is all and in all. Christ is all and in all. Having Christ, you have everything. If you have him, what else can you possibly need? Well, this isn't confined to the biblical characters. Let me quote you some glorious statements of the experience of men and women who knew this contentment. Listen to Charles Wesley. Thou, O Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find. So you see, if you're finding that in him, what else do you need? It doesn't matter what you're lacking, doesn't matter what you have. Thou, O Christ, art all I want. More than all in thee I find. Listen to another man putting it, coming to God, coming to Christ. What does he say? Sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find. O Lamb of God, I come. There is such a fullness of satisfaction in Christ. He gives me everything. There is nothing that I can possibly want or desire, but that I find it in him. So I'm independent of all other circumstances and conditions. I must read to you again some of the verses of that great and glorious hymn of John Ryland's which we sang just now. Can you think of anything to beat this? When all created streams are dry, thy fullness is the same. May I with this be satisfied and glory in thy name. Listen to him. No good No good in creatures can be found, but may be found in thee. I must have all things and abound. While God is God to me, he that hath made my heaven secure will hear all good provide. Then listen to this challenge. While Christ is rich, can I be poor? What can I want besides? Now, my dear friends, these are the things by which we test ourselves. Is he that to you? Of his fullness of all we receive, and grace upon grace. And you know the fullness. God has treasured and stored in him, says the apostle to the Colossians in the second chapter, verses 2 and 3, all his treasures of grace and of wisdom and of knowledge. It's all there. All the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in him bodily, and we have received of his fullness. While Christ is rich, can I be poor? What can I want besides? You see, receiving of his fullness. There's nothing else that you can desire. You have everything. You have all. He is the all and in all. He's everything. So it works in that kind of way. But then the apostle, in order to help us, works it out for us also a little bit in detail. And that is the wonder of this man as a teacher. Again, you see, I remind you that he doesn't content himself with a mere general statement. He says, now look here, I want you to be so certain of this, I'm going to illustrate it for you. I know both how to be a base. Do you know how to be a base? Do you know what it is to be content, even in the midst of adversity? You see, it's one thing to feel, oh, how precious Christ is to me when you're in a service or when you're singing hymns or when you've had some unusual experience when you're in the midst of saints. But suddenly you find yourself in a place of need, in a place of adversity, in a place where you're abased, cast down, treated badly by men, everything against you to drive you to despair. Do you know how to be abased? The apostle says he does. He's been let into this secret of how Christ can give him this blessed experience. How does he do it? How does it work? Well, this is a theme in and of itself. Let me just hint at the answer to you. It works like this. 
the saint, when he is abased, is driven the more to seek the face of Christ. You see, when things are going well, we tend to forget him. And when we forget him and depart from him, we begin to experience these needs, these lacks, this dryness, and it becomes subservient to circumstances. But everything goes against us, and we are bereft of all these things. What's the effect? Oh, it sends you back to him. And anything that sends you back to him sends you back to his fullness. And there again you have this all-sufficiency. Let me put it hurriedly by quoting to you what the Apostle says in 2 Corinthians at the end of chapter 4. Our light affliction which is but for a moment. Now notice what he says. Our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us. Worketh. It does it. It brings it to pass. It produces it. It works it. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And that's one of the ways in which it does it. It drives you to him. The same argument indeed as you saw just now in that passage I read from 2 Corinthians 12. When I am weak, then am I strong. Why? Well, because his grace is more abundant towards me. It drives me to him and I depend. Thy my grace is sufficient for thee. And he realizes that. So in need it drives him back to him. And you are again in all the fullness of the Godhead in Christ Jesus. So the apostle says, I know how to be abased. doesn't matter. You see, all things work together for good to them that love God. Not only the good things, but the bad things. Everything's included again. And that is exactly how it works. The saint is a man who is always driven back to him. And adversity has often led the saints to some of the most glorious and wonderful experiences. We had it during the last war as we've always had it. People under the tyranny and oppression of Hitler, they testified every one of them, these Christian saints, that they had a period of joy and contentment and happiness in prison that they'd never known before. It's been the universal experience. But come, let's look at the other side. I know both how to be a best. Listen, I know how to abound. This is infinitely more difficult. I think most of us are better people when we are suffering and when we are in trouble. The devil was sick, the devil a saint was he. And most of us are less or much better people when we are ill than when we are well. The whole problem of life is this, do you know how to abound? This is the danger. You remember the word about the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 32.5, Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. That's the universal charge brought by all the prophets against the children of Israel. They remind them when you were a small company, when you were an unknown people, when you were nobodies, and God was leading you, oh, what a wonderful people you were, and how you worshipped him and thanked him. Then you became prosperous. Things went well. You had a good time. What happened? You forgot God. You rebelled. Jeshurun and waxed fat and kicked. And so mankind has continued to do. But the apostle tells us here that he knows how to abound. He can take prosperity as well as adversity. Can we? What's the secret? How does it happen? Well, here's the mystic secret. If you have received of the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got an entirely new view of life and what the world calls its glittering prizes. You are enabled to see for their true worth and value. The Bible tells you, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. These are enemies of the soul. And it is a man who is filled with the fullness of Christ who realizes that. He realizes their danger. His head isn't turned by them. Success doesn't inflate him. This, this man, this apostle Paul, look at him, the mightiest preacher, the greatest evangelist, the greatest teacher the church has ever known, indefatigable, beyond everybody else. You know, what, what does he say about himself? He says, I am the least of all saints. He says, I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. That's his view of himself. 
His head isn't turned by prosperity and success. He sees through it. John says, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It enables you to evaluate these things at their true value and price. You're not carried away by them. You're not thrilled by them. You don't lose your head. You don't forget Christ. You say, this is the enemy. I need him now more than ever. If I needed him in adversity, I need him still more in prosperity. I know both how to be abased and I know how to, be, how to abound. It is he alone who can teach us the treacherous character of these passing ephemeral worldly things. So the Christian is able to say, O Christ, in thee my soul hath found and found in thee alone the peace, the joy I sought so long, the bliss till now unknown. Now none but Christ can satisfy none other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy. Lord Jesus found in the eye side for rest and happiness. I yearn for them, not thee, but while I passed my Saviour by, his love laid hold on me. I tried the broken cisterns, Lord, but ah, their waters failed. Even as I stooped to drink, they fled and mocked me as I wailed. The pleasures lost I sadly mourned, but never wept for thee, till grace the sightless eyes received thy loveliness to see. And then here's the conclusion. Now none but Christ can satisfy. None other name for me. I see that all the world has to offer is nothing but broken systems. It mocks me. It's going to leave me. It isn't lasting. There's love and life and lasting joy. Lord Jesus found in thee. That's something at any rate as to how it works. But my final word is this. How do I get this contentment? Well, I learn. I'm initiated into the secret. But the ultimate secret is this. That he puts his power into me. I can do all things through him, the one that strengtheneth me. And again, the better translation is this. I can do all things through the one that infuses strength into me. Like a blood transfusion. Like an injection of power. He infuses strength into me. So you see, in addition to learning, in addition to working things out in terms of scripture, in, a, in, in addition to spiritual reasoning, he puts his strength into you. Without you knowing it and you find yourself strong. Let me put it again in the words of the great apostle there at the end. He tells Timothy in that last chapter of that second epistle that at his trial everybody forsook him and left him alone. Nevertheless, he says, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. And he knows that whatever may happen to him and whatever his circumstances may chance to be, that same Lord will always be there, that his strength will always remain undiminished, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that all power has been given unto him in heaven and in earth. What then can we say? Well, shall we agree with old John Newton? Rejoice, believer in the Lord, who makes your cause his own. The hope that's built upon his word can ne'er be overthrown. Though many foes beset your road, and feeble is your own, your life is hid with Christ in God beyond the reach of all. Weak as you are, you shall not faint, or fainting shall not die. Jesus, the strength of every saint will aid you from on high. Though unperceived by mortal sense, faith sees him always near, a guide, a glory, a defense. So what hast thou to fear? As surely as he overcame and triumphed once for you, so surely 
You that love his name shall in him triumph too. My dear friends, have you received of his fullness? Can you do all things through Christ who infuses his strength into you? Have you been led into the secret? Do you know that place of rest and of contentment? Have you learned in whatsoever state you are therein to be content? The answer is to receive of his fullness and grace upon grace upon grace. Amen. The closing hymn is hymn number 397. Let us sing this to the praise of our God and our Savior. Rejoice, believer in the Lord, who makes you a cause his own. 397. falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit Abide and continue with us now throughout the remainder of this our short, uncertain earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall see him as he is in the glory everlasting and be made like unto him. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. 
You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.